Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first lecture for History 468, uh, History of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. I'm super excited to have everybody in the course. Um, some of you, I think, have had me as a GE in the past. So that's really exciting that that you've returned uh, to my course. Um, and yeah, I had a lot of fun writing these lectures. Um, one, like I said in my intro video, uh, the biggest downside of this course is like most of the fun in doing a lecture is picking everybody's brains about what they think and getting feedback and people asking questions and raising points or, or you know, side information or whatever that like makes the conversation more uh, fulfilled. And it's hard. It's like, I think maybe that's the thing is that I see what I'm doing here, like giving a lecture. Uh, I know not everybody does, but I think somebody like me or definitely like my advisor, Steve, um, definitely feels the same way. Where like I see this as a conversation. I feel like it doesn't really work as well when it's just like me spouting things at you. Because it, it's really like in order to get somewhere as far as like understanding with, especially when we're talking about concepts like settler colonialism, um, it, it's really hard to get everybody like really thinking about things in different ways when it, you're only just hearing like my explanation right? You're not, there's no questions, clarification. So I really, I guess this is a, a call to say, like, I really rely on, and we will all rely on um, your like feedback or questions or comments after the fact uh, to kind of just get a sense of like, you know, where everybody's at. Um, and besides just like testing your comprehension of the lectures, you know, like, I, I would, I just want to know what you think. Um, I would love to to just hear like what you think about the material and and like how I presented it, like sort of my the story that I told, in, in other words. Um, and yeah, I just would love to would love to hear from everybody. So we do have a uh, a questions and comments forum on Canvas. It's under the for or under the discussions page. Uh, you can also get on the modules page as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's the space to to leave any sort of feedback. Um, I, I would love to hear from everybody. So uh, again, though, thank you so much for being here. Uh, the one thing is that I may like clear my throat because I'm sick. Like my, of course, um, I have basically uh, a couple of weeks ago, I returned from my brother and I, my, my, I have one younger brother. He's like 20. Oh God, he's 24 now. Um, but uh, I'm 29. And so we have a few years apart from us, but we're tight. And um, we went to Ireland together. Uh, we're both very Irish. Um, and we just went on a kind of a, a vacation together just to explore the place and um, see some like family heritage stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, I was traveling internationally. If you've ever done that, like you end up picking up stuff, like you end up getting sick. Um, especially on a plane ride, you know, which was 11 hours. It wasn't the most fun plane ride. Um, but yeah, I got sick. And then I think the smoke has made me, it's made it really tough to recover. So my throat is annihilated right now. So I apologize in advance. I'm probably going to like take breaks to sip water. And I might clear my throat once or twice. So just bear with me. Um, but besides that, welcome to the course. Um, today, I think, as I mentioned in my uh, intro video, um, uh, this is really this, the, the introduction on a, on a thematic and, uh, conceptual level. So really just like when you read the introduction to any, if you read a, a history book by somebody like in a university press, there's the introduction section. And that's kind of where like the authors all kind of lay out their framework for thinking. And it, it's, it takes a little bit more paying attention to than I think like when you're in the meat of a, of a, of a book and you're like, and it's more of the detail. It's like, as long as like, what's more important, I think for me, at least to understand right off the bat is like how the author is approaching something um, because that, that impacts how they're presenting information and what information they're presenting. So it's like, I think that's where my priorities always lie. And I think this is like the, the equivalent of that. So it's like, I, I think it's longer than um, other lectures will be. Um, I try to shoot for about like an hour a week of material. Um, 
And so, yeah, this will be a little bit longer, but uh, than like a typical lecture, but it's really because it's including this introductory um, sort of a, a thematic or like these, the, the, um, the, th the, the theoretical section, I guess, is the, the better way to say that. But the theory that we're talking about is settler colonialism. And uh, like I said in my intro, the way that I approach things is understanding. And it's one way of telling the story of the Pacific Northwest. But I think that you can understand it, at least the history that from our time, from from our uh, perspective, from, you know, the, the 18th century uh, you know, contact with with native folks uh, by Europeans um, to about the mid nineteenth century, when there's a very clear tip in the balance of power um, towards you know settler settler life, right, being sort of the the default way of of existing, uh, and and having to basically um, accommodate that and live around that. Um, and I think uh, the the main point here is that I think you can understand that history as well as the history, uh, the well as the contemporary conflict that I showed you in the PBS documentary on the killing of the Klamath, um, which was made by the Klamath tribes. But on that lake, right? There's it's, there's um, a conflict that is settler colonial in nature, where they, there's native folks who are trying to and fighting to practice their um, ancestral ways of living, which is like like just fishing and existing on this lake that's been that that's been part of their fabric of their identity for centuries, if not longer. And um, and like um, one of the individuals said in the in the in the uh, documentary, like when the fish suffer like they do, like on a spiritual level, um, not just obviously like their food source, right? It's much more than that. And that's coming up into conflict with um, with cattle ranching and, and the water demands of like growing cattle feed. And that's why all that water is getting diverted because it's getting, it's, it's for irrigation for cattle feed to accommodate the cattle industry. And there's, so there's an economic incentive in in cattle ranching that's coming up against um, uh, native people uh, using the um, the landscape in the ways that they've historically done and that they have the right to, right? And like that is the that conflict is ubiquitous throughout the history of the Pacific Northwest. It's it's what we're going to see today. And then it's what we're gonna. It's what we saw in that documentary a couple hundred years later, right? Um, and that's the point I'm trying to make that we can. It's one one story of the Pacific Northwest history. There's plenty of other ways to understand that that incorporate other things in the history of the Pacific Northwest. But I think one way to understand it for me that's really valuable, given the the immensity of um, this conflict. Uh, that I think that that understanding this as being a fundamentally a story about settler colonialism and fundamentally a story about natural resource conflict. Um, I, I think that that's really, really useful for just understanding the world that we live in and the Pacific Northwest we live in right now. Um, but before we can even get started with that, we have to properly really get into what settler colonialism even is. So settler colonialism um, is really it was really popularized by as a, as a as a term and a as a concept. It was popularized by this guy named Patrick Wolf. Um, he's a scholar in Native American and Indigenous Studies. Um, about 15 years ago, he wrote this article that was really influential. It's kind of like the starting point for a lot of scholars for settler colonial theory. Um, it's called settler colonialism and uh, the elimination of the native. And it's basically the, the argument that he makes is, is in describing settler colonialism as a, as a phenomenon is that fundamentally it's about land, 
uh, and it's about settlers coming to permanently stay. And another way of saying that is um, settlers desire new lands that are already inhabited by people and they uh want to dispose they they there is no other choice for them for settlers if that's what their goal is to permanently come and permanently stay um they just dis- they they uh the the goal is to expropriate which is um a synonym for saying you know dispossessing uh the land there's that's the inevitability that's this that's the settler colonial project right is to dispossess the land from the indigenous inhabitants and claim it for settler society for for their own purposes um and for wolf again the the in order to fulfill the colonial project um it requires the systematic elimination and elimination is a key word not just the subjugation of indigenous people the elimination of indigenous people as as individuals as bodies as humans but also uh, uh, of indigeneity as a culture as the as the cultural um as the is as the uh, manifestation of being indigenous um that the any remnants of that uh that would potentially you know obviously um undermine the basis the 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 legitimacy of settler society society in settler society's eyes um indigeneity uh as being you know the 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 state of being indigenous to somewhere right and the cultural expression of uh, or cultural remnants of indigenous people um they also are part of that project of elimination um and what we'll see is is that there's many ways in which settler society um attempts to co-opt indigeneity as a culture as well as as um hopefully it's not really hopefully we have this sort of background where like the idea that settler society uh in 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 euro-americans which i'm going to say a lot euro-americans just means like the combination of your european settlers and american settlers because we're talking about multiple powers here but like euro-american settlers uh that you know that's the that's the goal i mean i think that that shouldn't like that shouldn't be hopefully too much of a um a shock i guess as far as as far as our history education goes at this point um that that's what the goal is but i think it's important to understand this as a function um of dispossessing land number one and that their goal is being hell-bent on elimination entirely and if you're you might be thinking that's genocidal like that's that's isn't that genocide it's like yeah no i mean i think i would be i would certainly make the case that that's that it wouldn't really be that hard for me i think that saying it's not genocide is like that's like overly you just overcomplicating the, the definition um uh, our own uh in the history department you may have taken courses with him um wonderful person uh, his name's jeff osler uh he's a professor um he's retired now uh but he still teaches as i think he probably will forever um he's just so good at what he does and he he is obviously invested in what he does um but he is very influential in these sort of discussions and he um he makes a pretty clear cut case that you know the what we call the logic of settler colonialism is what i just said like in order to to justify settler society's existence they ha- like it 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 requires uh the elimination of indigenous people and for for osler makes the point that that logic is genocidal just fundamentally and I, I I I agree with that. Um, and the thing is, is uh, that's important to understand here, is that settler colonialism isn't just something that happened and then we moved on, right? Like settler colonialism was one period of history of the United States, and now we're in a different period. Um, that's often how the story's told. Uh, that when we talk about the history of the frontier of the United States, the history of the West in general, not just the Pacific Northwest, but like Western U.S. history, 
there's the the way we tell the story. I mean, you can just look at like books or or movies or I mean, we could talk about so many of this type of stuff. This is the type of stuff I'd love to be like any examples of this and that you guys think of um, that we can't do. But I I think you could think of like well, think about like spaghetti westerns or something, you know, like just or like in the 1960s, like spaghetti westerns is being something that are produced in the 1960s when there's still plenty of native people that are living and existing and and do and and trying to um pursue their 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 rights and 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 improve their conditions and all of that like this is still the struggle still going on but spaghetti westerns are sort of like this function of like of hindsight of viewing like this the the frontier in the western history is all very um uh it's uh, uh glorified and but it's also rests on an assumption that like the frontier has closed there's no more frontier anymore right and that's sort of like in the 1890s or so um that's about where uh people at the time but also people later um kind of pinpoint as being like the american frontier is closed and there's sort of this like lamenting about that um but along with that is this indigenous erasure where um, it's called the myth of the vanishing Indian. That And that's like the what, how we talk about in an academic sense. Um, that And it really that's just describing how during that time and afterwards, um, there's th that sort of way of telling the story. The frontier closed. Now it's just the U.S., you know, coast to coast. And, and, and at that time there was a lot of anxiety about that. Um, but it rests on sort of this implicit assumption that the native people are gone, right? Or at the or uh, assimilated into white settler society entirely. And of course, that's not the case, right? And that's a form of, of uh, erasing just indigenous people as, as people, uh, erasing indigenous culture. So one of my, my point here to thread this is that this is a, the settler colonialism is a structure. It's not just something that happened. It's the very basis for how society, settler society is organized. Um, and that narrative about the frontier, American history's own narrative about that is actually itself a function of the settler colonial structure because it justifies it. It naturalizes its known existence. Um, and we're going to kind of explore some of the ways in which it does that. But just the way to understand this, it's not one event, right? And this is Patrick Wolf's argument. It's it's not just one thing that happened. It's a structure and it's a process. And we can see it materialize in all these different ways. In the, in the present moment, that's in, I mean, there's a million different ways it materializes, but we saw it in the Klamath documentary. It's, it's, it's fighting, a lot of times we can understand it legally, right? Um, in the sense that law uh, oftentimes has been and what, you know, it certainly was at the time used to um, sort of naturalize the settler society as being like, well, this is just what this is the law of property. This is just how it works. And um, and similarly, you know, Native American legal rights to uh, ancestral use of their of of uh, you know like fishing rights or uh, rights to use prescribed or controlled burns, things like that, right? Are very contemporary conversations, but those rights, those legal rights, have been historically denied to them, sort of on that basis. Um, so what I'm saying is, you really do have to look at like every fabric of society. Uh, uh, as not just being like, as I said in my intro, not just how things are the way they are, but it's like, that's an artifact and it serves a purpose. Um, I think that that's kind of like where we're, where we're starting this. So um, settler colonialism is not just, it, it's not just uh, something that applies to North America, obviously. It's a global phenomenon. Um there's a lot of discussion and debate on within academia, of course, um, as to with people who accept this, the general premise that I just said, you know, that people we people in um, genocide studies or, or history or Native American and indigenous studies, which is just NAIS is another uh, it's abbreviation for that. Um, people accept that general premise 
But then there's a lot of discussion and sort of debate on like, well, what are the bounds of settler colonialism? Is it the same everywhere? Does it look the same everywhere? Can we still call something settler colonialism if it looks different in some ways than other things that we've all accepted are settler colonial projects? Things like that. There's all this debate. There's all this discussion that um, that happens uh, in in these uh, for this field, and it's important stuff. It's really it is important to like understand um, where th like like the the uh, theoretical bounds of what what we're talking about here in settler colonialism. But I think the way that we understand it for our purposes is being about land, um, being about dispossessing it permanently from the the indigenous inhabitants. And then naturalizing that state of existence in some way um, through the settler colonial, you know, structure. Um, that is definitely just that bare bones explanation. That's easily, you know, you could find that in in other places around the world. Um, I think an easy example to look at here is is the you know this is a map showing what's called the scramble for Africa, um, and in the, the late nineteenth century. As you can see, and now we're going to talk about some of the the like this map. There's some there's a little bit of issues there. Um, yeah, I don't in territorial claim maps where it's 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 um, we're going to problematize it, but for our purposes right now, I think it does like serve the uh, it it serves as the the visual for like what really did happen, which is that you know all these European powers are looking around at, at their colonial holdings around the world and they're looking at Africa and um, they uh, there's a bunch of different economic incentives that sort of drive this to time. But you can tell that what happened was there was a literal, like a scramble, right? There's all these, these colonial powers that sought to stake their claims. And the way that worked was, you know, settlers went, looking for economic opportunity and the way that Patrick Wolf argues settler colonialism works is that the state follows. So settlers are the ones that kind of make it their way out there. There's a lot of lawlessness as because the, it's beyond the reaches of their own government. If you're talking about the, the British or something, South Africa is really far away. You have, um, you have uh, uh, settlers that just like, you know, they don't see their, the, the, the British presence, not like it really changed that much anyway, but it like, but point being is like settlers are just completely unchecked, but that's actually in the interest of the colonial power. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, settlers unchecked, just, just go out and try to stake their claims. And then the state comes and follows and then sets up a, either a legal or, um, you know, a pro you know, in the sense of property, um, but but set up some sort of legal or legitimate in in the settler eyes like legitimate basis for um, their their occupancy, um, and that is very much what happened in Africa too. Uh, South Africa is obviously I think the clearest example, like most recent example of like how you can how you can uh, trace that that history a hundred years later uh, to um, through apartheid and. And yeah, so that's kind of an, an, an apartheid being like this, you know, a function of the settler colonial structure, right? And that's kind of what our, our point is today. But at the same time, there's plenty of ways that I think that what we're going to talk about um, today for the most part is the ways in which like, it's not just the settler society that's legitimized or the, or rather it's not just through law or through other um uh legal means that which is is the way that settler society justifies its own existence it also does so by vilifying native people and indigenous people all around the world or dehumanizing them um just portraying indigenous people or native people in in various manners that is that is conducive to the settler colonial project right either that being uh, well, and the story we're going to see today is that that in the U.S. and in North America, that that portrayal was fundamentally in various you know iterations of it, but fundamentally the story goes even in the contemporary sense uh, when we talk about the frontier history or the or Western history is is one of of inevitability that 
this is just bound to happen for a number of reasons that rely that and that that statement relies on a lot of assumptions about native people but also like that it was inevitable and that native people because in some fashion native people were had fundamental weakness in a lot of different ways to you know they were just not suited for um that type of conflict and and against such a superior military and technological power and we're going to talk about how that's just not the case right but the point right now is that those are the sort of depictions that um that settler uh, colonialism is based on and this is a um this is a uh, picture of uh, Columbus landing the Bahamas and like I think it's one of the I think this is important to go back to, to, to 1492 to really understand this but at the time what you know there's like let's take a take a second to just kind of like think about the sort of like cultural attitudes that Columbus and his you know the Spaniards had uh upon upon landing in in the Caribbean right and encountering native people um there's obviously the the religious aspect of this where like this is for God's glory and that God uh is fundamentally um on the side of of uh Christ of like you know civilized quote unquote Christian society um and there's and so basically there's you know Columbus and folks uh see native people as being you know heathens that uh that are barbaric and uncivilized because they're not Christian number one but also because they don't um have the same uh way of living and for for Columbus you know they see this as like there's a this is a legitimate basis for 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 the fact that they think that the, this this land should not be theirs right these are people that are just uncivilized and, and barbaric and they're not even using the land the way that we would use it in order like growing uh growing sugar or what you know whatever it is um there's rationales that are that that they not and this is the point is like it's not necessarily like on the spot right it's like these are cultural attitudes perm that that are like like sort of um percolating in the in the minds of of Europeans uh upon contact right another thing is around this time ideas of race are really starting to become um more prevalent in Europe um it's still really early for that but it's 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 come you know obviously there's there were forms of discrimination and forms of discrimination in, in some ways based on skin color before the the concept of of race is the way we understand it was sort of uh invented around the 15th century not going to go into that too much of this history but it, it's it's a function of the spanish reconquista in a lot of ways where after they kicked the moors out um and and they you know there's, there's now a muslim minority um race on the in the sense that race being um the idea that there's immutable characteristics about people that uh that are physical and that they correspond to um to behavior and they correspond to um culture and 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 that there can be you know there's a you can prejudge somebody uh based on their these immutable characteristics as evidence for you know, the type of person they are or their culture or whatever right that's kind of like how i would shortly describe what race is in a general sense and for for the for columbus like these sort of ideas about race and um and racism are are also percolating right so this is the world that they're that that these guys are coming from and then they they land and they see native people and you know and of course they want that land and so the way so the way that i understand it is not necessarily like they want the land then they invent all these ideas about native people i think that that does happen i think that that is what happened to some extent but there's also it's like a it's a mutually reinforcing sort of thing that there's like 
already in 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 the culture in Europe, um, there was very much this air and attitudes of like Christian superiority, of of civilizing uncivilized people, and what in another way of saying unchristian people, um, and what the what Europeans need to do in order to 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 fulfill that is completely justified, right? Um, that is something that is carried, and then upon contact you know that that manifests in well we're just you know these people are uncivilized and they need to be christianized and and settled and learn how to um uh use the land the way that we would use it right um so that that's just i wanted to to just give you a sense of like that is the cultural attitudes and that's kind of like how that works it's not people sitting around being like how do we uh like what are we going to say about native people like like that does again there's plenty of instances in which people like do just deliberately like okay we got to come up with a way to like steal this how are we going to do that definitely happens but i think it's a little bit of an oversimplification oversimplification to think about it that narrowly there's also like there's just that's how culture works right um you're immersed in something from birth you have these and like these um cultural beliefs or, or things that just are taken for granted um, uh, and, and ways of, of understanding other people, you know, depending on where you grow up or depending on the type of environment or culture that you grow up, um, people have different uh, uh, really like, like the people are shaped by different cultural forces. And, and, um, and I think that that's really important to understand as far as like the world that European explorers and American settlers are are entering, and like all of just as a, as a way of saying, they have a they're carrying a ton of preconceived uh, notions about Christianity, about their their place on the planet, and and religion is central here, about race, about um, you know manifest destiny as we would put it, uh, the idea that this is supposed to happen. And they're carrying those with them, right? Um, and and then, you know, upon like wanting to dispossess land, these are very, very convenient rationales um, for that. So I think that's a better way to understand it. And like I said, um, one of the ways that Settler colonialism to, uh, legitimizes itself is through this sort of differentiation you know, that indigenous people are just fundamentally different um, and in some manner that 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 allows them to or allows settlers to uh, to go forward with the, with the colonial project. Um, like we saw, like I just said, uncivilized, barbaric, you know, all these sort of these depictions um are pretty ubiquitous at that time and this is important too uh that they're therefore unworthy of occupying the land right and it's that that's the big part is that well these people are not even using it the way that we would use it they're not farming and this is the thing is plenty of indigenous people farm, like this large farming operations but and all this stuff but in Certain places, you know, they see, they see, um, you know, even with farming, they, they're just not, they don't see the industrial side of things or quasi-industrial or whatever, the manufacturing side of, of, of European, Euro-American life. And the absence of that suggests to them that like they're, 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 they're not using the land the way that, that white settler society would use it. And therefore, settlers have just more of a right to be there. So this is, um, you know, another way of understanding uh, that sort of depiction, just visually. This is from like the 1590s. This is some, you know, English dude in Virginia that sort of did a, an illustration of uh, the native people there. Um, and obviously you can tell it's like, this is, it's a very um, primitive, um, it's sort of like over the top with the with the um 
with the sense that they're like, yeah, it's just very, it's just very de primitive depiction of society, you know? And it's, 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 it's very obvious, I think, to us in the, in the modern sense. Um, but even that said, indigenous societies still often simultaneously, even that we, you know, that there's a lot of depictions of them as being this, what we talked about, um, barbaric, uncivilized, whatever, um, and primitive. There's, they're often at the same time depicted as being, um, living as living in complete harmony with nature and with each other and that it was just this big paradise that everything was in harmony with one another um before contact and this is what we call the myth of the noble savage right in in academic sense as well um meaning that like these settlers still see native people as being like you know savages or, or just barbaric and uncivilized but that they were they were like just a function of the environment that they're like that they were at peace and living in harmony with nature but there's but that still means that they're uncivilized in the settler's eyes in, in other words right like they're clueless as to the potential of the land they're clueless as to how to how to operate in in white society white settler society um uh, which make and there which makes them you know in the settler sense like barbaric or or unworthy of being there but there's still sort of this positive association with like with like a like almost like an innocence that they were living in complete harmony with with each other and the land and everything was was hunky dory you know and um and it's a very it's a very uh, pervasive sort of idea about Native people that like, and it doesn't even have to be necessarily even negative, right? Like in the sense that somebody, somebody might have good intentions or might feel sympathetic towards, towards Native people um, or empathetic towards like what, what they, what certain people went through. You know what groups went through it under under settler colonialism under gen you know genocidal conditions um so the there might be somebody who like you know um like i said it's sympathetic but still reproduces this this uh depiction in inadvertently and one of the saddest ones i think was was avatar i mean i love james cameron uh, uh it's it's hard for me to 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 say anything bad about him but and i really liked avatar i think it's it's really good i think it's it's actually more complicated than your typical um depiction of 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 native or indigenous life in a sense that like maybe with the sense of inevitability it's a question that we're going to talk about today there's not really that sense of like their um them like losing it being inevitable or something right that's kind of what we're going to talk about um, but there still is in this in an avatar like there there are indigenous folk that live in literally physical harmony with with what is the entity of nature right that they connect with and that they are just from time immemorial they have lived in like this perfect peace with their natural surroundings uh, and know how to like and and can and literally can physically connect with it um, that is straight out of this sort of uh framework right and so that's what i mean it's like obviously james cameron's like not not sympathetic towards like native folks right that's kind of the whole point of the movie but that's what i'm trying to say is that even if somebody like that is is making a movie um sort of trying to in a sympathetic light you can still there's very much uh this reproduct reproduce uh reproduction of these discourses they get reproduced over time consistently in different forms of popular culture there's a really good book about this um it's called the ecological indian by shepherd crack um this is one of the early texts i read in grad school but it was really formative for me i just like I think it puts what we're talking about in really clear terms uh and it traces really the this myth of like just native americans living in complete harmony with each other and with with the natural world 
um, and how that got reproduced up until today. Really, really good book. Um, but And we'll talk a little bit more later about that sort of myth. But first, we need to talk a little bit about um, one of the main narratives of inevitability uh, that exist in, in Native American history. Um, I, I signed a, an article on this. It was also by Jeff Fossler. I don't know if you caught that, um, but it's about virgin soil epidemics. He wrote that for the Atlantic back in uh, April 2020, like a month into COVID, in the context of um, the Navajo, uh, who just got hit really hard by like particularly statistically um got hit really hard by covid eventually i i if i remember correctly um they were actually one of the leading like first first like like places and and people where they got their they they had like the vaccine drive i think they were like one of the if i remember correctly they were one of the first like ones like really have a mass uh, vaccination campaign um, really early on. Uh, but initially uh, they got hit super extra, like extra hard, disproportionately hard uh, by COVID. And Jeff's point was that um, it's not that native people, it's not that Navajo people got COVID easier, right? It's it, like something about them makes them that happen. It's the conditions that they're, that they're living in that makes them more susceptible to um, disease and for, and not only that, but for, it makes them, it makes recovering from disease that much harder. And that's what explains that disproportionate um, experience with, with disease uh, for native people. And he makes the connection to that's, that's how it's always been when we talk about native Americans and disease um, so we talk, he uses that to introduce what's called vir virgin soil epidemics. Um, and that's, that's a theory, uh, that virgin soil being like, you know, uh, land that Europeans hadn't just, you know, landed on, there's, there's no European contact yet. Um, but it goes that like native Americans, uh, have no no exposure to diseases like smallpox, like yellow fever, or like malaria, which are all from the old world, right? Um, and once those diseases got introduced, especially smallpox, um, those diseases just sort of on their own infected the the populace. And through things like trade networks or or just other forms of contact within the native within native across native communities, I guess that the that that uh, the disease spread and just uncontrollably killed, you know, seventy plus percent of the population. And we know that like clearly um, that is there's more going on than that. Um, this this sort of theory was popularized in this book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, you might have read it. It's not necessarily a bad book. I think there's some there's a lot of value in in um in thinking about history from that sort of macro lens of like it. He basically makes the argument that he starts off with like why why do some societies have more than others? Um, for me to answer that question, it's, you have to look at like systems of power. Like, I just don't see how you don't. But for him, uh, he he sees it as being more of like a function of like access to certain geographies. Um, and that Europe just so happened to be able to get to places that were, were conducive to or good climates for for things like agriculture, which it's a super easy it's just a way too simplistic way of and it, it and it erases sort of all of the all of the genocidal logic that we're talking about right in order to make that happen um but the point we're talking about here is that like he very much endorses this idea like yeah you know the the small you know smallpox is just how it was with with biology right there's no biological immunity and then they got hit and that's it 
And it's like, there's way more going on there. Um, the main evidence for uh, against virgin soil epidemics is that like in a lot of areas, um, you know, Native Americans come into contact with European folks who are there for sometimes years, decades. And there's disease that's introduced, but, and then maybe there's like a, a, a small initial shock, but the population recovers and stabilizes. It's, but in a lot of times, it's not until native people's conditions are uprooted where there's either there's displacement for some reason or some manner rather for some reason for some in some manner there's displacement whether that's like literally stealing land and being forced onto a reservation or uh whether that's just conquest or some sort of war or like just population loss from other means right At, like loss of of the of a regular food uh like a dietary change um Things like that that are all functions of just settler presence, right? And and conquest. Like they make the conditions for native people physically, materially worse. And just like the Navajo and during COVID, it's not that they're they're like just any more uh uh, uh particularly different. Like there's nothing that's fundamentally different about them. It's that like the conditions were made worse. And that's why those disease hit so hard. And of course, like biological immunity to, to novel diseases exists. Like that's why that's just how COVID happened, right? Nobody had any immunity to COVID, and um, and that. But that's a that's not necessarily a, an abnormal. Um, what I'm trying to say is like when there are novel diseases introduced into populations, um. There's a there's a very noticeable trend that you get hit hard, you know, just like COVID, right? There's initial big shock. Nobody has any immunity. It just nobody has any any antibodies. There's just your your body doesn't know what to do, and it's 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 fundamentally just the disease is gonna take more of a toll. Uh, over time, populations uh, for for novel diseases like that are hit, they recover. And that disease might be present more and, and, you know, be now a fabric of life. But that initial shock, the, that like populations recover from that. The problem is that, um, and so, so what are to, to thread that here? It's like, of course, native people did not have any immunity to that. And that's like, that really matters. Cause like it does it physically just biologically as, 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 as a species, as a human, as human beings, that's just how our biology works. Right. Um, similarly to this is a small tangent, I promise, but, uh, in the American revolution, if you know anything about this, uh, George Washington and Cornwallis, who's like the British general, the very end of the war, they're fighting in the American South. And now George American, uh, troops had and George Washington's troops were all from like Virginia and South Carolina. And they had grown up around which they're mosquito borne diseases, but malaria and yellow fever, like were the big killers back then. They didn't even know that they were carried by mosquitoes until like the late 19th century. So they're all getting this disease. They have no idea where it's coming from. Um, but George Washington's troops had, had uh, resistance built up to yellow fever and malaria because they'd been exposed to it since they were like probably their their parents so i i don't really know enough about um about like genetics or biology to really say how that works but very clearly like at least in their own experience like their own uh time on this planet like they their immune systems got like built up a resistance to this right um on the contrary the British troops that are coming from England, they know they have no, they've never been exposed to yellow fever and malaria ever. So they get to the, to the colonies in the American South and they're fighting in like the middle of the summer and they just get dust, just decimated by disease. Like, can you imagine that? Like in the, in the middle of summer in the American South, just so swampy. And like, these guys are just getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. And and it got so bad that like, you know, Cornwallis, the, the, the war ends at Yorktown uh, and with like the British under siege and, and Cornwallis is just like, we've lost so many guys that like, we just got to like, surrender. We can't keep doing this. 
it's not worth it. And so my point, and, and that's actually talk about like historical narratives, like interesting way to, to rethink like the glory of, of, of American revolution and why, you know, the, the, uh, the Patriots just, just beating the British back with their own muscle. It's like, I mean, you could really point to disease as being like the main reason why the British were like, dude, we're, we're out. Um, but the point where I'm making is that biological immunity to disease is really important. It's actually a, a really valuable thing to consider when we're talking about like history in general, just like disease is a super, uh, it's a, it's always present and it's always influencing how events happen. Um, so it's not like we, you, you just throw that out the, with the water. It's just, that's the reality. But the point is that, that the, the degree of the loss of life and the effect that it had on native communities, these diseases was infinitely worse because of the violence and conquest associated with, with settler colonialism and colonial presence. It's just uprooting the, their, their, their material conditions and material circumstances that they're unable to recover from that initial shock. And now the other, um, the other explanation that I think more, um, scholars are, I think, doing more work on now. And again, these things are happening in tandem. Um, but when we're talking about population loss, um, one of the biggest forms of population loss came from uh, slavery. So this is, um, this is Hispaniola. Um, this is the island of Haiti, Dominican Republic now. Um, so in the, uh, this is, and you have on the right, you have Christopher Columbus landing there. Um, so if you, if you know anything about that, um, the Spanish land there, they claim it for their own. And it becomes a very, very um, important uh, uh, island, arguably the most important, like, just piece of land in the Caribbean for like multiple colonial powers. But initially um, estimates for the local native people there, um, the population estimates range from, I, I think tens of thousands to at least several hundred thousand. Um, really hard to, to do those sort of estimates that far back. Um, but the point is, is that there's, let's say a hundred thousand for, for math's sake, it's just easy, easy number, uh, somewhere in the middle, hundred thousand people live there. Right. Um, and about, that's about 1510. Um, so, so really like we're only talking about very short time after, after initial contact. Um, now you would, based on our, our virgin soil story, you would think all those people, uh, like, you think all these people um, got diseases, and and the the point, like the 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 big piece of evidence here is that all uh, within a few years, within like fifth, I think it was like by 1514, 1515, um, that population gets down to only a few thousand. That's that's what that's what's recorded in um, in. Um, colonial you know ledgers and documents and diaries and that, that's what historians have put the pieces together as far as as far as uh population loss being talked about constantly like now and and about estimates um that within a few years that number dwindled down from let's say a hundred thousand to just a few thousand and you look at that and you're like jeez louise like that's a lot. That's a crazy amount of loss of life. Like what other than disease could possibly like be the explanation for that? Like those, like so people had to have been all wiped out by, by smallpox. Right. And the answer is no. Um, so uh, first this book, it's called the other slavery. Uh, it's by Andres Rosendez. It's really, really good. Um, and he does a lot of this work Um uh, uh, putting the pieces together, but he found that the first mention of smallpox or any or yellow fever or just any other diseases um, was not until like 1518. So this is like years after a noticeable 
sizable drop off of like 90% of the population, but it wasn't disease. The Spanish had enslaved everybody or, or that entire group and sent them to uh, other parts of what was now the you know, Spanish holdings in the new world. A lot of them went to Mexico to work in um, in mines and mining silver. Um, a lot of them went to what are called encomiendas, um, which are like basically labor camps that are were owned and operated by conquistador lords or other, you know, some sort of colonial government uh, government um, or administ administrators. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's that's the that's a pretty piece of convincing piece of evidence for me that you can't really you can't really argue with that. Um and so he's like, yeah, they they enslaved hundreds of thousands or like like tens of thousands at the very least. But the whole, they depopulated the entire island from, from in, in slavery, right? And I think that that is uh, that sort of work on this the, like on the slavery network, um, indigenous slavery network within North America as well. Um, he talks a lot about it in that book, but. It's, I think, becoming clear when we talk about population loss that, like, this is a humongous part of it. Um, and it's not really, up until this point, really been given the uh, credence and the and the um, the um, attention that from scholars that it obviously should have. Um, and what's really screwy is that... Um, like I said, historical narratives as being stories about ourselves are this historical narratives we have about settler colonialism and about um, the settlement of the West and and for our purposes, the Pacific Northwest um, was one of inevitability, right? And the and those narratives, like I was saying, they're functions of the settler colonial structure themselves, and they serve they they serve it because they they naturalize its own existence. And so similarly to that, settlers in the US, they see this history of 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 Ameri you know Native American population loss in in all of the Americas, North America, South America, you know, Caribbean whatever. Just humongous population loss across the board. Uh, and a lot from like like we we're saying from um from disease just being that bad like being made to be that bad. Um, but they see that as, as actually further evidence for the legitimacy of the settler state and, and of their project. It's, it's in their eyes, again, this is why religion is so central. Um, they see that as like, well, God clearly wanted white people, white settlers to, um, to take this land. Otherwise he wouldn't have like paved the way for us by killing all of these native folks off. He was obviously trying to show us that it, it was trying to open the door for us for settlement. That's literally the logic that um, that they operated under. So that's how these things are related. The historical narratives about, that's why we're doing this right now. Because in order to really understand uh, settler logic and how it's how narratives function, we have to go back to like on we have to disprove settlers' own historical narratives about native people. Really? So you know what I mean? So that's why we're doing this right now. And obviously, you know, with the this inevitability um uh talk, whether that be um Native Americans living in complete harmony with nature, um living in harmony, harmony with each other, of just being weak to disease just by nature of, and like just being overrun. Um, obviously this is all gonna affect how, you know, besides it's all patronizing and paternalistic for sure, uh, worse than that, but just at the very minimum. Um, but it's it's clear that like this, this representations of, of indigenous, this inherent weakness um, it affects how we tell the story. And that's one of inevitability, like I've been saying. Um, they were just hopelessly destined. They were just gonna, they were they were just uh, unavoidably going to be overpowered by a superior military and political power in the US. In, the, in our context right now, that's what we're talking about. Um, 
and plus disease as being uh the the uh accomplice to that um but it's still one that like native people were just going to get i mean if they were just going to get uh um overrun by an by a superior force because of all of these different things and our story today is that that's not the case and in fact what we're going to see is that native people held a lot of power in the northwest you know both upon contact initially but also well after contact, well into the 19th century, it was the Northwest was very much a native place. They ran the show. And in fact, you know, for certain native groups, like we were, we're reading about the Macaw in Josh Reed's book, um, their power actually, they were able to increase their power uh, after contact, after, you know, uh, seller presence um, and, and the presence of, of, you know, trade interests, um, they were able to leverage their control over the local, you know, their not and and their knowledge over local resources and trade routes to really benefit and um, build their own their own centrality to that network. Um, really playing off of what was what we're going to see is really from the the desire for furs. But also other goods as well, and so and another way of saying that is is Euro Americans and traders, they relied a lot on Native people. Now they relied on on certain Native groups, the ones with access to those resources more, and in turn those Native groups um, were able to deliberately use that to increase their power within the Native world in the, of the Northwest, and that's what we're gonna. That's our story today. Um, obviously we just want to be historically accurate, right. Um, in how we, how we approach just like telling what, what I, you know, saying, saying something like this is how things really happened is super precarious because we, we talk about this in history all the time. Um, it's just really hard to say, because you can always, you can always throw a question into, well, this is the way things really happened. Um, you can always like look at some other thing or ask a different question about the period of history and then you get a different explanation. But obviously like events, things happened and there are, I think, better ways to understand them than others. And it's just historically accurate in the way that we understand the term accurate uh, to say that like it was not inevitable that that um native people were going to get overrun uh by by settler colonialism in the northwest it just it's just i think it's not besides being my point is that besides being just important for contemporary discussions about native rights and about um how we tell the story it's just like it's just not accurate right it, there's just also like it's just not the case it's very much we could see based on all this evidence that uh native people in the north some native groups in the northwest really um were able to maximize their benefits of this and that's what we're going to talk about today um and before we do that we really have to look a little bit at this idea that they lived in complete harmony with nature right that they're the the noble savage as we said uh that untouched living in perfect harmony with with um with animals and and with with their their local environment and basically they it's a way of tying native people to the environment it's just being sort of a function of of the pacific northwest almost like they're just the way that settler like you know logic or whatever talks about this is like they're almost just like part of the environment right and obviously that's really not that's a damaging way not just beyond like the humanistic side of that but just it's not it's not the case um and really native life dependent on on constant modifications to the landscape um in, in a really dramatic fashion 
they used uh, prescribed burns um, to open up land for, you know, for multiple use, but mostly for farming, like here in the, in the Willamette Valley, especially, right? Um, and for hunting, you know, just farming would be much easier uh, once they were able to, to make pastures by burning, right, regularly. Um, it also helped by opening up uh, land for for hunting game like it's just way it's it's easier to hunt if you're you're less you know in a lot of ways if you have less tree cover um you can see game from farther out you know whatever it's just easier to hunt um and for and for easier travel too it's uh shouldn't come as surprises you know if they people want to get uh want to have a road or or uh, just a main you know just they want to be able to uh, uh, travel easier across land. Um, it, it would be, it's beneficial in a lot of ways to, to do that. It also, um, there was defense reasons for this too. I didn't list that, but like there, there were, there were reasons to use controlled burns to like shape the local, like, if, you know, um, the, uh, how do I say that? just like a local environment. Like if you're, if you're in one village or something and you're, and you uh, burn, you know, the surroundings and you have more visibility um, that actually has defense benefits too, right? Like you can, you have more of a uh, watchtower effect over your own like village or whatever. And for, for any, any, um, you could see any sort of like invading parties from farther out, that sort of thing. So there's definitely like defense, uh, benefits for that as well. And so people, native people were constantly just, and I mean, these are by, by our standards, they were burning a crazy amount of the, the state of the states, uh, that we're talking about, like Northern California or Oregon or Washington, they like, um, a large portion of what of what we would of those like can you know those contiguous states right now um were, were burned regularly by native people um and 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 so so the point here is that it's native people did not live in complete harmony with their with with you know uh nature this would this would give the sierra club a heart attack <laughs> like looking at how much like the the uh uh, the forest burn, you know, how much the forest they burned every every year or every few years, you know, for for generations, for hundreds of years. And so what happened is that uh, over time, Native people maintained the, a fire ecology in the Pacific Northwest, where the eco the local ecology of the reason, uh, region acclimated to this new uh to like there's always a fire ecology in the pacific northwest there's always fires always been present but native people shaped the local ecology for hundreds of years to the point where that's the new fire ecology that there's more open space there's less super super dense um forest and that actually has its own effects on the local ecology and landscape right and the point is that was done through by our standards, very dramatic changes to what the what the environment would have, you know, quote unquote, naturally looked like. It was naturally looked like there's trees everywhere, and the and I actually it's hard to say because it, it uh, because it, it being like what would it look like in the absence of humans in general? I would I would imagine just you know bigger trees, um, but but more frequent fires. Um, from things like lightning and, and things like that. Right. But for native people there, it's like they, the point here is that they modified their, their immediate landscape to their benefit, to their liking. Um, and they did not live in just like this perfect harmony with the, with the surroundings, just like any other human beings, they shaped it dramatically for their own benefit. And I think it's important to, to understand that it, there's plenty of, contemporary reasons why this is important uh not not the least that indigenous fire practices are just scientifically speaking like so much of a better way of managing um wildfires um than what the forest service especially in the in the u.s has done where 
you go, I said this in the intro video, you go out in the woods in the Cascades, especially where there's fires all the time. And they don't, you know, Native Americans, are, that this is controlled burns, what they're doing. They're doing controlled burns constantly. And the Forest Service historically has been reluctant to um, to do that, to do that sort of thinning and to do that sort of uh, controlled burn work. Um, and the and the consequences of that are obviously like there's more dense understory. There's more smaller trees. It's more kindling. It's just you get more explosive fires because there's all of these um, because there's a more dense understory in, in, in the native fire ecology. There wouldn't have been that there would be much less um, of that dense understory and much more open space. Um, the Spanish actually uh, at the time um uh in in uh in california made mention and we're going to see this with with yosemite um they made mention of the fact that the tree cover was so different and that it looked like for them what they said was a well-tended garden um so think about that i mean it, it, it's it, it's a spanish deliberately and uh knew or i guess recognized that there was there was intention behind this massive uh change to the environment so look at the tree cover difference here um this is yosemite um you can look on the left 1872 this is not it's not like that because of forest you know deforestation you can look at a lot of the stuff in the willamette valley um or something where there's like clear cuts and and it's very clear that's like was logging right that's not what this is you can see that um, on the left that there's just there's plenty of trees still intact it's just that there's big open areas and, and that it's easier to travel within right and then you look on the right in 2020 and the place is just like there, it's 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 huge there's just trees everywhere it's super dense and i think what's really interesting this is where we're going to problematize concepts of nature and what is natural um throughout the course but like you might look at the right side and be like, that's how things are supposed to look. That's how, that's what it looks like in the absence of humans. And in reality, it's like, that's also an artifact. I mean, if you look at all those trees, none of them are that big. They're all fairly small and they're all fairly um, dense, right? They're not hundreds of years old. They're more recent. They're, they're, they're less mature trees. And if you have a lot of those in one group, and like that dense like that, you're going to get just massive explosive fires. And there's a lot of reluctance, of course, for multiple reasons, not all of them bad. Um, but there's a lot of reluctance to to use that sort of prescribed burn uh, technique that indigenous people, um, uh, you know, really had been doing for generations. Um, and so that's the point is that there are massive by any standards, this is massive alterations to the way that things were quote unquote naturally gonna look in the absence of humans. And that's our that's our main point. They were not living in complete harmony with nature. And it's important it's, it's besides being patronizing, it's important for contemporary discussions about like restoring tribal uh um uh, sovereignty and and uh ancestral practices like like prescribed burns besides just like the 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 legal you know they should have the right to to pursue their ancestral like uh practices it's like just it would be for just the benefit it's just more beneficial there's a sign like plenty of very clear-cut scientific reason to do that so um yeah it's just i think that's a really really important point to make here for for our purposes going forward And similarly, um, just like the idea that they live in harmony with the environment, they live. There's an idea that they lived in harmony with the harmony with each other. Um, that native people are just native people, and uh, you know that there's not that that there was it was not the uh, it was not the reality of the uh, or it's not as contentious as someplace like you know Europe where there's wars and 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 po political entities that hate each other like france and england and and that's those are the sort of our attitudes that native uh life is just there's just native people right um but of course like there's 
within native society, just like any other society, there's, there's conflict. Um, there's different identities. There's different social organizations. There's different access to resources. Um, and I think we really, in order to really understand like how that worked, we first have to look at just how native society was socially and culturally organized in the first place. Um, so we re we're reading Josh Reed's book. Um, there's, you're welcome to read more uh, in it, obviously, uh, than the selections that we were reading. But he does a great job of of detailing why it's how complicated native identity and social and cultural or uh, uh, in a cultural social and cultural sense was back then. Um, it's not just as easy as there was this tribe. You know, they're uh, in in this area and then southwest of there, there was this tribe and then there was this tribe and so on and so forth. So tribes in that the way that we're familiar with them, which is actually we're going to talk about how that came to be next week. Um, tribes in the way that we think of them are very much like an ethnic sort of like identity, right? Just like the Macaw, um, the Salish, Kalapuya. You know, that's uh, there are tribes or entities that exist now, but at the time, in a lot of places in Pacific Northwest, even though those tribal distinctions were recognized, they didn't shape communal identity as much to the degree as they do now. Um, you know, instead, uh, most of the Native people in the Northwest lived in uh, really multicultural groups where uh, there were more in villages. Um you might have members of all these different tribes living together, right? You might have, there's members of the Macaw, there's members of the, of the Salish, there's member like whatever. Um, I guess that would be a little far, but uh, the Duwamish, right? Like there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of different tribes that were uh, living in uh, members of certain tribes that were living in villages together. Right. And for native people then, as, as Josh explains, um, those tribal like identity was based more on one's clan or one's like local village i uh more so than those than those uh you know broader ethnic or tribal distinctions right so what mattered more at the time for native people is not so much like i'm part of that tribe he's part of that tribe right it's more complicated than that um it's that identity and, and interest what you know what you would want to go to bat for if you're a member of let's say you're a member of the macaw living in a village where there's a lot of other um there's members of different um tribes right um your interest is not necessarily going to be like well the macaw up up north are doing this our our immediate local interest is securing uh or, or is like is continuing um to secure this really important fishing um uh uh area right because it's 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 key to our power in tr in maintaining trade with other native villages in the area right so that's kind of where that relationship starts um with how certain villages benefited or certain clans benefited to to the expense of others and why there was conflict why that there was contention just like any other place on the planet um you have groups that are trying to fight for their local interest and that comes just by definition um if if one one uh group has access to a, a prime fishing spot that makes them it makes other groups uh maybe down you know down the line um or or more inland or something it makes them dependent on that group for those for that those goods for fishing right for for whatever it is so the point being here is not to get too specific um but just that resources are distributed on une unevenly in the pacific northwest um and some native groups had access to those resources more than others did and and those local interests right mattered more where you lived and the and what your village's activities were 
uh, were more, that was more of a determinant of like, of identity than just the base tribal distinctions were, were used to. And that they did still recognize at the time. And then I want to make it seem like there were no tribal distinctions. It's not the point. There definitely were. Um, but the local interests often superseded that. And so here you can kind of see um, maybe a little bit more of what I'm talking about. Um, so this is from Josh Reed's book. Uh, this is just like two parts of a map where he shows sort of native cult. What we th we think of as as uh, as where he's like tribes, right? They're they're more like cultural areas of influence. So uh, the, another way to understand this is like if you see at the top of the, the Olympic Peninsula, the Northwest, the the, the very Cape, yeah, that's where the macaws are. Um, and then you go, you know, if you go um, directly south of there, you know, you have uh, multiple different uh, native cultural groups. Now that doesn't mean that like, um, you know, I think you guys should be able to see my pointer here, which is cool. Um, you, you have this group, you have this group, you have this group, you have this group, right? It's not that like this group lives here, this group lives here, this group lives here. It's that obviously there's going to be, um, there's going to be uh, cultural overlap. There's going to be different groups living with other groups depending on where the villages are. And my point here is that like, while those tribal distinctions obviously mattered for like those local clans or tribal um or tribal uh village associations oftentimes were like the determining factor for for identity right more so than that and that's important um because of this point right like those resources that we talked about are not just dis geographically distributed evenly so um one of what we're seeing here there's called commas um so commas was uh um it's a flower uh, that produces these like onion like bulbs and they're starchy. They're like, they're basically just like a precursor. Um, actually in, in, in Northwest history, the once the potato is introduced, um, it really supplants um, the commas as being like the starchy sort of carb base and a lot of native diets. But until then um, commas was really like uh, those it's, it's, high in calories it's it's a really it, it was a really great um staple food uh, but it didn't grow evenly of course just like plants don't grow evenly there's certain areas where you get more and it's a very labor intensive process right you can see that on the left there's a nez purse woman um who she's a ton of it and like doing and just crushing it by hand and um and harvesting that way um but the point is is that Access to that as a natural resource gave advantages to certain native groups, right? If you were able to control where those, where the, the prime growing spots were, you'd have more of a, of, a, of a staple food source that would help your population. But also then you could leverage that in trading for other goods, which would increase your power even more, right? And so that's kind of, that's just like any other human society, controlling natural resources for uh was was central to securing power and this is another way uh, i mentioned fishing but obviously fishing is central to um to native life in the northwest um this is called a fishing weir um that's it's like a dam basically but it's it's designed to uh to catch like or to, to block fish and to just you know it's it's it uh it helps to just kind of create or simulate a dam effect where, or like just creating a big giant pool where fish can't get through. And areas in which those were constructed and reliable for fishing were super important for, um, for local communities to, to maintain their access and, and um, control over. Right. And there's not, the point here is that there's only so many spots in the river um, there's only so many people, like, if you're not in one of these spots, you're not going to have as good of an access to this level of fishing. And so it's advantageous for those that, that are there. And so, you know, knowing what we're talking about, um, how, what we've talked about so far with natural resources, um, 
how do you, this is where be one of those points where I'd stop in the class and, and let you all answer. But like, how do you, just how do you think this affected the balance of power within native society, which I think is our whole point. It's not that, that everybody lived in harmony, harmony with one another. They didn't, you know, just like any other humans, there's conflict over this stuff. And so some groups are, and, and think about this is going on for hundreds of years, right? Like longer, um, these sort of these sort of uh uh conflicts and so this is this is sort of a constant presence um in native history and it's not just that they um traded with each other and everything was all good you know there's constant conflict um over the resources and the territory with, uh, in which they're held. And this is a world that the European explorers entered, right? It's not that they, they entered in and they were able to just kind of like take advantage of native people who were just living on the land and, and minding their own business. They had to um, navigate all of this strife within the native world in order to maintain their access to fishing, right? Like if the you know, uh, European traders come in, they they need native expertise, not just to know where the natural resources are, not just to know who the powerful groups are, but they need to know that so uh, in order to just maintain trade, right? Like they need to navigate this really complex social sphere. Um, and they rely on native people to do that. That's the point. Now, all of this really it started to explode um, and really take off. These and and I, the 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 degree of European presence felt, and the degree of European reliance on native people um, exploded um, when uh, Europeans really discovered um, the potential for um for the northwest being an economic investment and that was in the form of first um so um at so at the in the very beginning at the very beginning um the uh um of settler colonialism uh the russians um had already uh been in the Northwest, um, they had uh, attempted to colonize Alaska for a very, very long time. Um, it was found in the late 18th century um, in you know the Russian Alaska up here. And then you have the British in what is now Canada in the Northwest. Here we're talking about, you know, you can see uh, uh, this is like British Columbia is the area that we're we're talking about here. But the point of this map is to show you how many different competing powers knew that this area was going to be um, really, really lucrative for for trade. Um, that is, uh, you know, you have the Spanish in the southwest. You have uh, the Dutch here in the east. And obviously very much down here is in the southeast of here is is the the states. Right. Um, and I wanted to ask again, these are one of these things where I'd love to pick your brains, um, and stop, but, um, based on what we talked about so far, do you see any sort of problems with the way that the Northwest is represented in this map? Um, just stop and think for a second, like what, based on what we talked about, about native society, about all of that, what do you think that the problems here are? The main problem that I see with this map is that there's no native people, right? There's there's all these claims. This is what I had kind of previewed uh, earlier. Um, there's all these claims. This is the, the problem with territorial claim maps. Uh, it doesn't represent the reality of the world that Europeans had to navigate or the reliance on native people to do that. It's not, in other words, Russia was not present everywhere in this map. The British were not present everywhere over here, and so on and so forth. There's local areas of, of where British 
you know, may, may have had more of a presence, but they clearly didn't occupy this entire area, right? They didn't, the Dutch didn't occupy this entire area. And what we're talking about with reliance on native folks is very clear that they had to navigate a native world and, and, and to not, um, these type of maps from this era, well, it's not from this era, but a map showing this, the, the sort of claims of this era, um, you have to be really careful because they misrepresent the fact that native people still obviously like, like control was in native, was with native people, right? Over this territory. And while these colonial powers make land claims to it, that doesn't mean that they occupied it at that time or not even close, right? It's, it's, they still, this, that's why this, you have to be very careful with these type of maps. Um, it's super precarious to just look at this and be like, oh, wow, the British were all the way out here. And it's like, not really. They claimed that and they had maybe some influence in certain local areas, but they certainly were not present in all of that. So similarly, um, we can look at uh, some of the history here for the Pacific Northwest. So um, there's this company called the Hudson Bay Company. It's, it's abbreviated the HBC. Uh, in the 17th century, they really take off uh, in the fur trade um, in, you know, with French fur traders, um, uh, trading with them. Um, but really in this in this area um, around the Hudson Bay, and there's a main shipping port for the fur trade um, up until like through the 1700s, right? And this is their charter. This is where their, their main areas of influence are. Um, now the Hudson Bay Company, um, it's a private company, right? It's not part of the British government. Now, however, um, what had happened was uh, there were multiple uh, companies that were operating within the fur trade and things got very uh, bloody between those companies and the British government said, Hudson Bay Company, you're ba they basically gave the Hudson Bay Company a monopoly on the fur trade. They said um, there was a lot of infighting, a lot of different uh, companies vying for influence in the fur trade, British companies. And the British realized that that was undermining their efforts in the region, that they're like, we want them to be a good trade. You guys are screwing it up because you're fighting with each other like corporations do for, you know, for for profit and for control of the market. Um, so the British government came in and they said, uh, none of that. We're, we're, you guys are going to merge. And so this is, so then what happened was by the 1800s, after the Hudson Bay company grew, um, they also then started to uh, like have more influence and try to make their, make their way out to the Pacific Northwest uh, in pursuit of the fur trade. And really once the fur trade, and we're going to see with, with what, you know, beavers were, were big in hunting beavers were big in, um, in this area, you know, um, as well as as in Canada here, but obviously beavers were not the only thing that were hunted here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but you can see basically just how much that influence grew, uh, and the and this is just a representation of of really the growth of the fur trade more than it is the growth of the Hudson Bay Company. But even with this map, right, like this is these maps are doing the same thing we just we just looked at where um you have uh you have a representation of geographical influence that just blanket assumes that like their influence in all of this area right and it's like that's not really how that worked it's much more localized than that and this map funny enough this is actually from the hudson bay company like in present day which i couldn't believe was still a company um hudson bay company still exists I don't really know. I should probably should look that up what they actually do. I have no idea. I definitely not trading furs, but um, this is from their website. And this is actually a really useful, better way of understanding the um, the areas of influence. So you can see the light blue is trading on Hudson Bay. So you can see kind of like around here, there's uh, a few you know trading ports that would then be exported out to, to Britain, right? Um, so then the pink is the original sort of like, uh, um, 
the original Northwest. So the actually, yeah, the pink is the Northwest company. That's the other company that I was telling you that they merged with. Um, so then you can see the important point here is like the yellow, the blue and the pink all together. Like this is the HPC territory. And so instead of obviously like they're not in, they're not present in all these like really remote spots. It's like along waterways, along um, routes that there's posts, right? And little areas of influence where um, this is, you know, this is a major trading post, but it's not like they own all of, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, in Victoria here, but Vancouver Island as a whole, they're not present on the whole thing, right? It's just the trading port. So that's kind of the way to better, a better way to understand that. Um, and of course, the the thing that they're after are sea otters who are just freaking impossibly cute. It's just devastating to even think about. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but you can go to the, if you live in Eugene, uh, you have some time, um, you can go to the uh, Oregon Coast Aquarium. It's like in Newport, I think, or no, I think it's actually in Lincoln City. Um, Anyway, on the coast uh, uh, here, a um, few hours west, uh, there's a, a the small aquarium, but it's really cool. They have a lot of cool exhibits, and they have a couple of sea otters that I think they, the story goes they rescued a couple as pups, and they've raised them. And I couldn't, I couldn't get over like I've seen river otters for a long time. I, I you know, grew up seeing them. I saw, you know, you just see them sometimes you're on the water, but geez, they are humongous. They're just absolutely enormous. Um, they're like, I mean, the ones we saw at the at the aquarium were like, got to be like four or five feet long. Like they were just like massive. Um, and basically, I think that's just kind of giving you a sense of like them as animals. But there was a lot of demand for their pelts. Um, so here you can kind of see how this trade um, took off. Um, this is again, Carrie's map, no native people here. Um, so that's a, that's the major issue with maps like this is that there's just no native people. You can see like the, all the forts and all the areas of influence, but it's just like, where are the native people? Where are the native area, areas of influence? It's like, uh, like we had said, native people uh, or Europeans relied on native folks to um to gather these pelts for them it's not like the europeans were out there hunting them um to the same success rate um so to not have them represented as being like part of the the trade is is not accurate right anyway the point is that um this is a representation of the trade itself so all of the red are just like areas from which like furs in general now this is including other this is like beaver and other forms of fur but really it's like this coast line where they're they're going after sea otters um now what are they getting in what what is this area you know what are they trading for and where are they sending it to it's a good question like who's who are the purchasers like why is there an economic incentive behind um hunting for, for sea otter pelts in the first place. Um, and that was because of the buyers, right? So what happened was um, Europeans could pay native people in either their goods or just not a lot of money uh, in order, f in, in, in exchange for sea otter pelts, which there were, at the time, um, a lot, they, it's seemingly a lot of to be, to be had. Um, and, um, they could, but they could basically, it wasn't a large buy-in cost to get the product, but they could upsell it to, a you know, to a large, large profit, um, to buyers who were willing to spend, who really didn't have that same sense of how much things like the production cost, in other words, were. Um, and those in large part were, were uh, were Chinese buyers. So in, in China, in the 19th century, um, furs, especially for, like sea otter pelts, 
um, became a luxury and uh, with the higher classes. And it was really, really well desired for, you know, like um, as, as part of fashion, as part of like a, a, a luxury for, a, you know, uh, it's just it being it being expensive or whatever is part of the deal. Um, so it just there was so much money to be made, in other words, for for Europeans in this trade. Um, and they would on the right here, you can see that one of the HBC, the Hudson Bay Company steamships, they this is the type of like vessel that they would use to carry that uh, sort of like pelts across to um to London and then which would trade for um, to China for other goods. All right. And, but they had to, the invention of steamships helped a lot with um, the preservation of goods, um, which is the, the, the time that it took to go back to London. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so basically the reason that there was such a big trade in, in sea pelts is, and there's like, it's like a, a they call it soft gold um, because the production cost, in other words, of Europeans paying native people to go out and hunt pelts for them, which is what they they relied on that entirely, which is our point, our last point. Um, the production, the buy-in cost for Europeans was minimal from their perspective, and the payout to to merchants, and not just not just Chinese, but that was like one of the main buyers um, in exchange for. China had obviously a ton of goods that the Europeans wanted, uh, silk, tea, I mean, you name it. Uh, there, there's there's plenty of things that, that uh, the English especially realized that, um, that furs would help them obtain, right? Um, and that's, that's the main point behind what drove that kind of the gold, like the gold rush for, for pelts. And like I said, it, it really shouldn't come as a surprise that Native people were way better trappers. Um, I mean, they knew the area better. They'd been living there for generations and generations. Intric intricate knowledge of the local ecology, of you know patterns of of migration for certain animals, and and when the peak times were, things like that. Um, Europeans had no idea. Euro Americans had no idea how to how to navigate any of that, like physically or just like they didn't know any of the patterns, right? Um, and our point earlier was that in order to even access this trade at all, those Euro Americans had traders had to navigate this really complex uh, political and social landscape uh, within Native society just to just to get there. Um, and so, what did Native people get in return for this? Like, why would they? Even you know, if they're not getting paid that much in comparison to what Europeans are making from that, then why do it? Like, why, what's the point of that? And it's because they obviously benefited from it too, for some, to some extent. Um, so in return, they got a lot of trade goods that they wanted that Europeans and Euro-Americans could trade them. Um, and a lot of it, again, just desirable goods, just people want things that are going to make life easier or make them more powerful or whatever. Um, so that included gunpowder, uh, horses. Um, but then really what, what the, the major point here is, is that native groups like the Macaw knew how, knew their position in the trade. They knew that uh, Europeans relied on them. They knew that if they were gone and if they weren't the ones that were doing this, that Europeans would be screwed and they would not be able to, to, to maintain that level of influence maintain that level of profit. And so native people knew the position they were in and they knew the leverage that they had. And a lot, um, and, and, and in various instances, they were able to like the Macaw play off certain powers, like vying for access to this trade, the Americans and the British, for example, both want access to this trade. Um, native people, a lot of times were able to successfully and play them off off of one another to get what they wanted. And I think that that's a really important point for, again, our inevitability discussion. N nothing was inevitable. The, in, in a lot of ways, these native groups for the short period um, significantly increased their power as a function of their own actions and their own, their own efforts. 
But what do you think the consequences were? You know, obviously, I think in hindsight, we can realize there were some consequences uh, long term. But what do you think, like even in the short term, what do you think the consequences with this for what, what this uh, uh, for this were rather? Um, and one of the one of the things that I think are, is really important to to recognize is the trade aspect of this. So like we just said, the Macau uh, to were able to increase their power to some degree. But they also grow, they had also grown reliant on like they they grew their power, but the source of their power was participating in this trade, right? It, it's it's being part of this world now. And while it was in their interests, like within native society, the Macau were able to become more powerful in comparison to other groups, right? Um they'd grown reliant on not just participating in the trade, but also goods, like trading with Euro-Americans uh, for, for access to, this, to the same goods that they'd now become accustomed to. Um, and what do you think the consequence of that was, right? That there's now they're, now they're bought in to this new, to this, this new trade system where they are pretty much the, they're benefiting from economically from, from it, but now they're now, whereas they weren't, they were just, you know, participating in a local trade. Um, now they're participating in a giant trade in almost industrial quasi industrial trade of, uh, of pelts that are not just like they're in exchange for some other goods, but people are making, are are making um, profit. Are they they're making they're they're building capital. It's an investment. Um, that's a different part. That's a different uh, trade network to buy into and to participate in than one in which they were more accustomed to within native society. That people obviously traded for com commercially, right? They traded. They they went out hunted. We want to go trade with this group and because they have other stuff that we want and that's but there's but the the difference is the economic incentive um for just building wealth making money off of money that's that's a, the new feature of um of this trade and, and there's some consequences of that and obviously i think the more immediate one that comes to mind is like if you have you have this huge profit incentive, just like a gold rush. All these crazy, you know, people coming out flocking to become to to get part of it. But that gold is killing sea otters for their pelts. What do you think that did to the population? And what do you think in turn that did to the local ecology? Nothing good. Um, so great book um this is uh ryan jones I, i'm i'm doing so much uh legwork for the history department here i'm not even necessarily they're not they're not paying me for it um so hopefully hopefully they know that i'm 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 singing their praises but ryan's in um he's part of the our history department he's great uh he teaches uh pacific uh history a lot on like the ocean world um he does a lot of work on whaling and environmental history um really great guy um uh definitely recommend taking his courses he teaches a environmental history course it's great um but anyway he wrote this book called empire of extinction um he, he works on on russian um you know hunting like for uh just in the sea for different creatures whales sea lions stuff like that but he looks a lot at, at the, the sea otter um uh, trade, right? So here you can get a representation of just the scale of the trade. And this isn't this isn't even necessarily at the height, which is so nuts to think about. But you can see like, so the Russians, like I said, the Russians are in Alaska, they're in the North Pacific for a lot of this time. They're part of this trade. Um, you can see about the like the, the 1780s is really when it takes off. And you can, if you look on the the y axis, um, it's 
the you know it's in the tens of thousands of sea otter skins exported so every year or like like so between 1790 and 1797 it's like it's a hundred thousands uh hundreds of thousands of, of of skins getting exported over over decades right and that's just the russian north pacific that's not the that's not including like you know what we would think of as current day washington or oregon or northern california um that's just the russian north pacific i mean that's just immense i, I can't even conceptualize that and similarly um on the flip side we can see the the death of this industry um so here's just sea otter skins exported from california now again like 1780 um you're up to and, and a little bit after that they go to 25,000 um per year which is just so so and in, in possibly insane um but you can see what happens like how do you think that why do you think i guess the the numbers dropped off and it's kind of almost like a rhetorical question at this point but it's like there are no more sea otters left they had they had murdered them all and um that's i mean i think it's probably the from in hindsight be like well yeah that's what was, was going to happen but at the time they like just there's just a free for all for forgetting these that there's just no sense of of forward thinking there's just profits to be made in the moment that's what we're going to do and then it just crashes because there's no more sea otters and in turn obviously that had a lot of effects to the local ecology in terms of like you know sea otters that are a predator you know you take a major predator out of the ecosystem it's going to have ca cascading effects and so if like i had mentioned the macaw had had really benefited from this trade but their source of their newfound power was this new economic system and so now what what do you think happened once the economic basis for their new power collapsed like what do you think to that what do you think happened to that new power yeah but the, but at the same time we need to ask this question simultaneously so okay the the, the industry collapsed and this was the main source of economic opportunity for europeans and for americans well, then how did that balance of power tip? Like if the if the industry crashed and this was like the main source of power for even Europeans and Americans, well, then we we do know that at some point they they conquered the place. So like how did that balance of power tip if the main source of their power, the economic power is now gone, right? So really it's that British, American and Russian powers could really no longer main influence in the Northwest through trade alone, right? That's how they were doing it up to that point. You know, they had the HBC company, but there's no big permanent um, mass settler exodus over to the British Northwest. It's it's mostly the influence is being done through economic means. It's It's done through trade, right? But now that is no longer an option. So how do you maintain it? If you're one of these powers, how do you maintain influence? in the Northwest. Um, and of course, one of the incentives to do that is the presence of other world powers. It's like, well, the British are like, well, we don't want the Americans going in there and then taking this opportunity to do this. And the Americans are thinking the same thing about the British, especially coming off the War of 1812, which we'll talk about next week. Um, but the point here for right now is that that's no longer an option. So what happens? Settlement. And there's, of course, a couple other reasons that spurred that. So there's two things that we're going to be talking about next week. One, gold. Finding gold um, in the 1840s throughout the, the, the last several decades of the, of the 19th century. Um, that spurred on... Um, mass settler exodus to the Pacific Northwest, which was increasingly violent. Um, but again, 
major, a new major economic incentive. And on the bottom right, what's the other one? The other one was cattle. And like we saw in the climate documentary, cattle uh, and native people, um, or like the uh, the cattle industry and native rights are uh, in conflict at present. And they certainly were hundreds of years ago as well. That painting, it's not native people trying to hunt cattle. It's trying to deliberately kill them. We're going to talk about why, but they're going after settlers' cattle to deliberately kill them, not to hunt them. And you can see in the picture, settlers aren't aren't uh, some guy in a cowboy hat. Not too not too fond of that idea. But we're going to explore why that happened, what's the context behind that, and then how both of those things relate to this balance of power tipping. Because in the Northwest, none of that was inevitable. But we need to understand it as being contingent upon economic incentives, upon political power, and that the story of Native Americans just hopelessly being overrun was just not the case. And for a large portion of time during the, the sea otter trade, um, they were able to to maximize the their the their bent to their this to their benefit. And that goes against the major historical narratives that we encounter every day about Native people. And next week, what we're going to see is like the reason we understand settler colonial violence and now the obviously the existence of the settler state is in large part due to what is just economic incentive. It's just money to be made, profit to be had, right? And that's when things really start to, to take off. Um, so that's it for today. Um, thank you all so much for, for listening. Again, this is a little bit of a longer lecture than the future ones are going to be, but we just had to set everything up. Next week, we're going to jump right into um, about the 1830s, 1840s, start talking about cattle, start talking about gold. And then we're going to uh, finish with the Indian Wars in the late 19th century and how all that culminated. So thanks again. And uh, I hope you enjoy your week. If you have any questions about this, would love to hear your feedback. Um, please put them in the in the discussion forum. So thanks again, everybody.